21. Doesn't he just let it die? Does he not have enough mana? Yep. Carson, 26, long, one. Oh, and there it is. Carson Frank Carson wins game one. one. Carson takes a 1-0 lead over Ding Liang. We are now going to move our cameras back to the other table, and we're going to check in on the match between Tomohiro Kaji and Andre Coimbra. So Kaji's up two games here, two games to one. Yeah, Kaji playing the Gazi Glare deck that the Japanese brought into this tournament. It's been tremendously effective for them in the Swiss. It got three of them into the top eight. And now Kaji trying to put a second copy of the deck in the semifinals. But he's playing in a matchup he didn't like his chances in. He was uh, he was very nervous about Ninja the Deep Hours. He was very nervous about Hypnotic Spectre. And he was very nervous about uh, Demir Cup Purse. Yeah, I, Coimbra's deck looks pretty good against Kaji. It seems like he's got some threats and the Gazi Glare deck can't deal with right away. I mean, it is sort of the beatdown deck versus the deck with Keltorn Outposts in it. So I can sort of see where if Kaji actually gets his engine up and running, especially if he gets gets Glare into play, he should be fine. I haven't seen how uh, Andre sideboarder, but he does have three Faith Critters in the sideboard, which can uh, shut off the uh, Vita Gazi City Trees. Yeah, that's actually... One of the interesting things, what I heard in my ear from the spotter is that the coverage reporter believes Coimbra has butchered his sideboarding plan. Then they think this is going to be the last game just because Coimbra has sideboarded so badly. I want to find out what the details of that are. I mean, how could he sideboard badly? What could he bring in? Circle of Protection Red? So uh, it's interesting to note also, I talked to Coimbra about his sideboard, and he uh, his main concern coming into this tournament is he thought he was going to play against red decks all weekend for some reason and uh, almost every card in his sideboard is there as a uh, defense against red decks he has a 15 card anti-red sideboard so theoretically he's not really prepared for any matchup although like I said I think the Faith Shredders if he brought them in seemed like they would be very good well, it looks like he is uh, stuck on one land and a bird Wow. Right now. I just got two city trees in play and a land war elf, and he just wood elfed for another land. So his, uh, his city tree's online next turn if he wants it. And he's got all his different colors of mana now because he went and got a temple garden. Well, he left the fetters in the sideboard. Yeah, he left the fetters in the sideboard. He's not. If he's, I don't. I don't understand uh, why he. He also has the current tribe elder in the sideboard, which seems a little bizarre. They're still there. He basically did not sideboard at all. Yeah, he didn't sideboard a single card. Which those face fetters seem really important to the matchup. I think that's why uh, Scott Johns came to the same conclusion you did. He's like face fetters seems good. Why isn't he? But then why isn't he bringing in face fetters? Although right now it doesn't it wouldn't really matter if he had faith, but there's not. He's, he's still stuck on uh, two lands while... Uh, oh, wow. You got to feel bad for the guy, too. He knew he was keeping a one-land hand, and he sat there while Frank Karsten finished off... I mean, while Frank Karsten finished off Ding Liang, what was it, half an hour? He was sitting there wondering if there was land on top of his library. Oh, okay. And his hand uh, his hand looks uh, double putrefy. He's got double Hypnotic Spectre. He's got yeah. counter spells. The hand was all about land three. Could he play a turn two Hypnotic Spectre or not, which was one card. He just sat there for half an hour wondering what the top card of his library was. Oh. And it was not a land. I wonder if it occurred to him that he should have brought in the Faith Fetters in that half hour. <laughs> it wouldn't help. wouldn't make a bit of difference here. It looks like, oh, there's a land. But it's a green land. It's not a black land. It's got to be. His mana can't be super consistent, right? Let's see. He's got one plains, two islands, one aboro, four watery grave, four yabamayakos, four forests, four overgrown doom. Uh, now Kaji is just attacking with elves. Lanowar elf, Lanowar elf, wood elf, wood elf. It, it starts to add up. You get enough elves into play. It's for a turn. Uh, I also think uh, Kaji's going to stone rain his bird this turn by uh, cycling Arashi. <laughs> Can he do that and make a token? Wow. Cornbread uses putrefied Lanowar elf, and what else is he going to do? Mm -hmm. got nothing else to spend the mana on. Um, Kaji chose not to do that. I guess he'd rather catch a he wants to make a token as well. Also, yep. he wants he to make a token. 
you think that's wrong? You think you should uh, channel Arashi? I, I don't know. I, I, over ten years, I've just been conditioned to kill the bird. <laughs> and here the bird is casting another putrefy. Not a spectacular use of those putrefies. I mean, trading them for elves. But suddenly you turn two cards on in his hand by not killing the bird. Right. I mean, Cornbread's at nine. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for the putrefies, he'd think he'd be at six, seven. Oof, Coinbird draws another Putrefy. Still can't play the Hypnotic Specters. He's getting attacked to death by 1-1s one with a couple of 2-2s two in his hand. With those city, with that city tree up and running, I'm not sure Coinbird can come back here, right? I, I, don't, I don't see what he can possibly do. So both Portuguese players were believed to have matchup advantages against the Japanese. And that's just not the way it's going to play out. You think Coimber was uh, thinking about how many wood elves he'd get to kill with his putrefies when he was building the deck? <laughs> or when he was sitting there for half an hour? His hand's just dying for double black. Well, it's just hard caster, Rashi. He's big. <laughs> Bring out that man. Plains was the draw from Andre Coimber. So the one Actually, planes, he has those cards either. The one planes comes to bite him. Wow, gotta feel bad for the guy. Could Still get, a great could, weekend. Could Still. cast the face fetters here if he had it. True. First Pro Tour ever, and he's sitting in the top eight of the World Championships. You gotta feel. No, congratulations. Gotta feel congratulations great about the weekend that Andres had, but at the same time, you gotta feel bad. I mean, I'm sure this isn't the way he wanted to go out. You know what? I bet the home crowd will take it. Absolutely. <laughs> Japanese fans in this crowd are delighted because Tomohiro Kaji is through to the semifinals. Three games to one. He defeats Andre Coimbra. It'll be Kaji versus Mori, and there will be a Gazi Glare deck in the finals, and it will be piloted by a Japanese player. So either Kazuhiro Mori or Tomohiro Kaji will be playing Gazi Glare for the World Championships finals sometime this afternoon. We can have some pretty interesting boards with a couple of seedborn muses. Some, uh, <laughs> both, both players have the seedborn muse sideboard. We're going to go back to, uh, oh, this side go back to our match I between Carson and Ding Long. Yep, there you get Ding, see Ding Long on the left, Frank Carson on the right. They have shuffled up. They are off to the races in game two. I hope they're racing. Akira Asahara awaits the winner of this match. There's Frank Carson. One of the one really one of the best players in the game right now. He seems confident. He seems on top of his game. He seems like he understands all the matchups, all the subtle advantages. Doing very some, well respected and and just a good guy. People like him too. And doing some excellent writing also about the game. Sure. Really, really uh, teaching people how to play the decks that uh, that are out there and talking about some really interesting uh, yeah. talking about some really interesting tricks. He's he, he's the, he's the full package. How much do you think writing plays into, uh, you know, a, a player's standing in the world, just the way people perceive them? How, how big a part of Oh, you know, gigantic. It's kind of interesting. John, John Finkel is someone who's never really uh, written about the game. True. And Bob Marr is another player who's never written about the game. But I mean, if you're good enough, you can become one of the stars without writing. But you have to be at that Finkel Maher level, I think, to become that famous without putting your name out there, putting your work out there as a writer. But, I mean, the writers, like, people feel like they really know Frank Karsten. I mean, Zvi, obviously, Zvi Malchowicz was one of the big figures on the Pro Tour from before he won. Even even when he wasn't putting up great results, he was still considered one of the big stars on tour. Right. Very influential deck designer right from the beginning. I mean, look at, a, look at a Gary Wise. He's going to be on the Hall of Fame ballot next year, and people are giving him a lot of serious attention, and his resume doesn't really measure up to some of the players, some of the other players around him. I mean, compare his resume to Steve Mahoney Schwartz. Right? Steve-O's resume of results is way better, but I think Gary's got a better shot at the Hall of Fame just because, because of all the writing and all the community building that he did. Doesn't Gary have more top eights? I don't think so. Gary has uh, three teams. He has one eight. individual top eight and two or three teams. Steve only has, well, we can check how many Steve has. I mean, I know Steve has the win in L.A. He has the second in Mainz. He has multiple Grand Prix wins, if I'm not and mistaken. He has DC, so he has three at least. Yeah, I think they're about even on top eights. And Steve has a win in the second in individuals, which I think counts a little more than a team win. Carson, 18, long, 20. 
I don't know. I mean, if you look at if you look at pro points, you look at career money. I think Steve-O is significantly ahead of him. Steve, Steve has the three uh, the three wins: a first, second, and a third. Sure. <laughs> I actually think Gary may have caught up a bit because Gary's career was longer. Caught up a bit on the lifetime winnings, the cumulative career stats. Still, my point being, it's certainly debatable as to whose resume right. is better. Yeah, and I, I would still top eights, but three of those I think are teams. Still counts. Because people wait a little. The way I think it waits slightly less, but still totally counts. I would say three teams equals two individuals. So then it's a wash. So it's a wash. But but yeah, Gary was a. Uh, a very influential writer for for a number of years. Right, and so I definitely think it's it's a way players can definitely make their star, really, make their name known, become one of the one of the real figures in the game. Well, it's kind of interesting. Also, it it, it causes if you're a deck designer and you're a writer, you're forced to constantly design decks to sort of. That was where I was thought you were going with the question. Well, that's ultimately where I was going. I get easily sidetracked, but he so he the greater good deck that he's playing is something that he wrote about. Uh, because you know he had to write his column that week, right? And it wasn't a deck he thought very much of, and uh, but he talked about it and he thought it was kind of interesting. He didn't necessarily think it was top tier deck. He certainly didn't think he was going to play it at Worlds. He thought he was playing Gifts Ungiven, right? And uh, I mean, Karsten tries to play Kakusho, and Kinder puts it on the bottom of his library. It'll be back. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I do think that being forced to write about magic really helps you think about it. Helps you forces you to get your thoughts straight. I mean, I know back when I was writing, just writing turning reports which was sort of one of my specialties each event i'd be sort forced to sort of remember and describe situations from every game and you know it's it's a very effective way to, to get better at magic it's just to look at very detailed situations and try to figure out what the correct play was right forces you to analyze what would happen what precisely your, what your how you could have done better how you could have uh, you know what your preparations were yeah well and carson so carson ends up playing this deck he made a pretty funny joke uh, we were talking uh, on Friday, yeah. and he said, you know, I said, so it's kind of weird, you know, you wrote about this deck, and then you end up playing it, and he's like, well, it's like hiding it in plain sight, right? <laughs> you know, he's like, I wrote about this deck, so if anyone's looking to figure out what deck I'm playing, they'll figure it's every possible deck but this one. Right. So, and, then he, uh, and then he laughed, referencing his match in Nagoya, he said, who is the bluff master now? <laughs> Yeah, he, was, he made the same joke, uh, or similar joke, when we were talking about sideboarding. Like, what does he bring in? You know, he, re can, he has the ability to transform his deck in a couple of different ways. And he said, yeah, maybe I, maybe I can bluff him out. Right. Although, although Carson does say he wasn't necessarily bluffed by so. I know. And there's a, see a cranial extraction looming in, uh, in Ding's hand. My lab cluster. That's definitely a card that, that uh, influences uh, Karsten's sideboarding decisions. He said, based on uh, what cards Ding sees from a cranial extraction, it was going to certainly affect how he was going to sideboard for subsequent games. Because he doesn't want Ding to have complete information about his deck when they play. Yosei from Frank Karsten. Yosei with Hinder Manor open. What, what is going on with Ding Leong's draw in this game? Uh, He's supposed to be, I thought he was a creature deck, right? Isn't he accelerate out creatures and just enough permission to be the sort of aggro control tempo based deck? He doesn't, done, doesn't seem to have done either of those things. No. Nope. What's kind of, uh, and Yosei sticks. I can't see exactly what mana Corsa is playing. I'm kind of surprised he hasn't tried to get uh, Dosan down into play. He's holding a Dosan in his hand. He might not have double green though, I can't tell. Ding is just topping and playing out lands, and I, 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 he loses in the late game. I think he's obliged to try to be the beat down here. He, not, he can't do that if he has nothing to beat down with, which might call into question. I, I didn't see what opening hand he kept. Have we heard anything from anyone who's played the Gossi Glare deck on the boards? No, not, not that I've noticed. So yeah, I mean, uh, looks like Ding's holding a handful of sideboard cards. He's got a natural eyes. He's got two cranial extractions. That's all reactive though. But he has no permission and he has no creatures. Yeah, I don't think he can afford to keep a reactive hand. I think he's got to be, he's got to get out some damage source, and then you know if he's reacting to Frank's threat, he can buy himself a couple of turns. But I think Frank wins eventually. He'll eventually just exhaust Leon's ability to react. I mean, I guess extraction can. 
punch a hole in Frank's strategy, but it's, it doesn't. I mean, Frank has enough different ways to play his deck that extraction isn't lethal. And he has to make a decision about whether or not the, gr the greater good is the card that Karsten was talking about, whether or not he would leave in the deck okay. based on the cranial extraction. So, I mean, Ding has to make his cranial extraction decision. Does he try to extract greater good or does he try to, you know, the greater good deck or is he extracting a gift deck? And, right, right. And, and those are two very different decks to attack. Right. So, uh, you know, something of a transformative sideboard here for Frank Karsten. Frank's trying to figure out what on Frank earth is in Ding's hand. He's just talking out loud through it. And he just nailed it, too. <laughs> It's like, what do you have? You naturalize and cranial extraction is the only cards he can figure out that Ding would have and just not be casting anything with six mana. He knows his dragon resolved last turn. He's like, all right, how do I play against an opponent who has naturalized and cranial extraction in his hand? Well, I summon a big monster. Doesn't and then I summon another big monster. Doesn't need to play Doze and everything's resolving anyway. Right. Yeah, Carson has deduced exactly what's going on, and this is exactly why Cranial Extraction isn't devastating. Frank can just summon these fatties and attack with them. Well, there's, there's not a lot Ding's deck can do about something in the board, on the board, I should say. Right. Save for a, his Jitte. Although he can steal it with Kega. And it's interesting, Ding, Ding's deck is a, uh, you know, modified like, critical mass update. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, you know, the green-blue deck, and, and a lot of the other versions of this had Vinelasher Kudzu, so that they had a really early threat. They could play Vinelasher Kudzu on turn two, right? and, uh, you know, by the time this point in the game rolled around, well, Karsten would be facing a, you know, 10-10 Kudzu. Kudzu that who, he would who else, somebody else was playing Critical Mass Update and explaining to me why Vinelasher Kudzu was bad. Was that Olivier Ruel? Yeah, I think it was. And what did he, what did he say? Because the threads are just well, yeah, in the Swiss, in the Swiss, that's the problem. Terrible. I mean, uh, all there were the most played deck in the Swiss was a Juicy Control deck, or right. similar to the deck that uh, that Andre played. No, but, sorry, that, that Marcio played. Marcio Carvalho. Yeah. The pro and that deck runs threads of disloyalty. Main deck. If you if you run out Vine Lasher Kudzu, all of a sudden, if that's the only target you have for threads of disloyalty, you take a potentially good matchup and turn it bad. Right. If you can attack the mono blue deck with no real threads targets, that's just that really helps that matchup. So, yeah, Olivier was explaining to me it's. Fine Lesher Kudzu is wrong for the deck because of Threads of Disloyalty. Right, but I'm not sure if the deck is, is right without it, just because you have no early game save some L's. So you think uh, if in a field of a bunch of mono blue decks, this is just a mistaken call? It may, it may be. So it may be. if you're ever in a situation to run this deck at all, it's because it's a field where Fine Lesher Kudzu is good. Right. Maybe. I mean, Certainly I mean, they would have been I mean, good in this matchup. Certainly can't argue with Ding's results this weekend, though. So I don't, I don't know I don't know what he played, but I mean it, it, it got him here. But it's do we know what his record was on day one? Uh, you should be able to look that up, right? We do. Yeah, Ding Leong facing down Kagamaro and Yose. All he's got on his side of the board is a Wood Elf, a top, and some land. And I'm not really seeing anything save a Kega here that's gonna. Yeah, I, I feel like Karsten has inevitability in this matchup, and, and that means Ding's obliged to come out aggressively. He did not keep an aggressive draw. Kept a reactive draw. My turn? No. It, it looks like Ding went 4-2 and two on day one. Which is not spectacular for a top-eight competitor, right? 4-2, four, 4-2, two, four, two, four, two would not get you top-eight. He went 4-2, uh, 4-2, four, two, four, two, five oh one. There you go. So he picked up steam as the tournament. And extended. Long. So what are you playing extended? Long, it sounds like where he made had the best day. He played uh, Boros deck wins. Wow. Yeah, All right, Karsten attacks with Yose and Kagamaro. Yep. Wood Elf takes one for the team. And Leong is down to eight. Yeah, Ding falls to eight, and he's just going to lose to damage next turn if he doesn't pull something out of his sleeve, or out of his top anyway. <laughs> Don't wonder too hard, Carson. You already figured it out. Uh, probably saw a hinder on top. And decided he wants to keep mine open for death or something. Uh, the fact that Ding is not even casting the cranial attraction seems a little weird to me. Like he's just slow rolling it, right? He's just sitting in his hand, not getting cast. I think he just did he just get the black? Uh, he can't figure it out. 
Nope. Yep. Of course, let's see. There's no reason to play into what he thinks is a hinder in Ding's hand. Uh, hinder top, on top of the deck, and that's north. exactly what he said. He said, you have a hinder on top of your deck, and Ding <laughs> had a hinder on top of his deck. Ah, uh, wow. That's awesome. He's uh, he's reading Ding like a jam day tome. Ding should just cast extraction here to see Frank's deck, right? Oh, we got North Tree. It's a boom boom. Karsten uses the term the Dutch have popularized for big creatures. Is it the boom. Dutch? I thought it was Neil that started that. Is it Neil or is it heroin? I think Neil is Mr. Fatty Fatty Boom Boom. It's sort of a Dutch American Indianapolis alliance that those guys <laughs> have, uh, have all forged through Gable Halls. Rune's out there somewhere. He can tell us. Have to get our etymologies correct for Magic Slime. Rumi was Carson definitely the first serving. person I heard saying boom boom. Carson sends just Yosei. Flying over the North Tree. That'll drop Ding to three. Threatening to win the game next turn. Looks like Carson's going to play Dosan. Yep. He's got a Yose and a Gorgeous Vengeance in hand there. Uh, looks like Carson does go for the double Yosei play. And then he'll be able to Gorio's Vengeance to Yosei next turn. Attack with it? And attack with it for the win. Oh, and Ding scoops him up. So Frank Carson wins game two a little bit faster than game one. He just comes out attacking. Ding keeps a reactive draw and can't do anything about the fatty fatty boom booms. Carson leads two games to zero. Carson needs to win just one more game. We're going to move them to our hero table and get ready for game number three. Gotta like Frank Carson's chances here, right, Brian? I mean, he's up two games to zero. I mean, and he, he's just shown that uh, he's in. He seems in control every time we watch the matchup. He's reading. Uh, he's reading Ding like a like a paperback book. Welcome back. Hey. We're just going to move our players to uh, the hero table so we can get that overhead camera lined up on top of them. Uh, I'm Randy Bueller. I'm still here with Brian David Marshall. Howdy. And it's been pretty good so far. Uh, how do you feel about the day so far? I'm pretty excited. This is uh, I, I'm I'm really happy for Ak Akira Asahara. He, yeah. He just he he was he, when I talked to him while we were doing top eight photos. He was like, well, you know, I'm just happy to be top eight, and that's really all I could ask for because I, I'm not sure. going to win. I mean, I've looked at this matchup and I just don't think I can win. And even this morning, he still seemed like, he's like, well, I mean, I have a chance. He modified it a little bit, <laughs> you know, after sideboard, but he, he just felt he felt like he was going to get destroyed by counter spells. And Didn't so happen. I'm really, I'm really happy to see him, him get through and, and get some of the uh, credit he deserves and, and, and get some of the uh, attention that he gets in Japan on a, on, a, on, a more, on a more global basis. Makes sense. He waits for the winner of Frank Karsten versus Ding Leong. That's the last match going in the quarterfinals. Frank's up 2-0. He's got the better matchup, especially after sideboarding. Got to like the Dutchman's chances. Yeah. Have we, have we, do we know how he – now, did he sideboard into a gifts package? Did he leave the greater goods in? I didn't hear. I mean, he's got a lot of options, so who knows? And we don't even know. And then game three, it could be something completely different. That's what, And that's what he promised. He said, you know, I'm just going to keep Ding uh, on his heels with my sideboard strategy. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just – you know, and, and he might, and Carson might side different side differently had Ding decided to use cranial extraction. And he could have, <laughs> like, why wouldn't he name cranial extraction on Gorgo's Vengeance? That was really bizarre. Why did he not even cast it? I mean, shouldn't know, Ding want to see Frank's deck? Uh, find out about the sideboard? I would assume he would want to know. And I don't uh, understand that at all. And again, a card like Gorgo's Vengeance or Gifts Ungiven or Greater Good or anything like that he could name and... You know, at least give himself, you know, some, yeah, not just some information, but no, I mean, some I don't think it was. Against. I don't think there was any way for 
ding to use the cranial extraction to win the game, but I think he could have used the cranial extraction to get information. I mean, Absolutely. we're talking about Karsten's ability to change the sideboard, but Ding should at least want to know where things started. Right. If you know what he started with, then you can then you can potentially guess react to it. Whether or not he's going to switch. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Karsten just seems like he's on top of his game. And quite, quite frankly, Ding Leong that doesn't. Was, that was great. He's like, what are you holding in your hand? I don't know what you have. But yes, it's, you have should be extraction, extraction and naturalize. naturalize. And that's exactly what he was holding. And then, and then the next turn, he's like, you said go. What? I think you have a Tinder on the top of your deck. And sure enough, when, when we looked at uh, Ding topping, it was a Hinder right on top of his deck. It was... Very impressive. From yeah, it's very, very, very impressive. And, you know, it shows that he's really also studied the matchup. He knows the cards. He knew what right. was going to be there. Yeah, he knew the sideboard cards. It's funny, you listen to 